Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Atlanta History Center's Author Talk series. My name is Claire Haley, and I'm the Vice President of Public Relations and Programs here for the History Center. It is our absolute pleasure to welcome you all here tonight for a very special guest. Um, it is one half of the duo responsible for the book, This Will Not Pass, Trump, Biden, and the Battle for America's Future. We are joined by Jonathan Martin tonight. And just in, this book is actually on its third week officially as of you know an hour ago. Um, third week on the New York Times bestseller list. So we're just so excited. Yes. So excited that Jonathan is able to join us this evening. Um, him and his uh, co-author worked on this book for over two years. They interviewed hundreds of people on both sides of the political spectrum, inside Washington, outside Washington, and what you're holding in your hands, or you're going to purchase before the end of the night to hold in your hands, um, is a book that just really delves into the 2020 election and offers some really amazing insights that I know all of you will enjoy hearing this evening. He is a correspondent for the New York Times and CNN, and he is joined tonight by our very own hometown, Rose Scott, um, who, as many of you know, is the host of WABE's show, Closer Look with Rose Scott, an award-winning journalist and sure to make for an amazing conversation. They will be taking your questions at the end of the night, so keep those, and I will come around with the mic. If you have a question, um, they will gladly answer them. If you haven't yet purchased your copy of the book, they're 25% off tonight, only out in the lobby. Um, so we hope that you'll support making a run at another week on the New York Times bestseller list and support Atlanta History Center by purchasing the book. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jonathan Martin and Rose Scott. Good evening. How y'all doing? Y'all came to see me? <laughs> and this guy here, Jonathan. Wow. Number three, well, you, you've been on the list for a minute there, right? We're feeling pretty good about that. No, we're, we're let's get the book. There we go. There we go. Um, <laughs> we're feeling pretty good. Uh, uh, nothing succeeds like excess when it comes to books, as the saying goes. Um, no, it, it's gratifying um, to, to be on the list for uh, a third week. Um, uh, we spent a lot of time uh, on this book, and um, um, that was fun to report it and to write it. And the selling of it has also been been uh, a lot of fun, too. We've been traveling now for three weeks. My uh, wife, Betsy, is here. My parents are obviously here, too, tonight. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's... It's great to see this, uh, have the success that it's had. So thanks to y'all for being here. Uh, and full disclosure, uh, Jonathan was a little upset that uh, his book is being best by some celebrity books. Um, I can't use the word that he used, but he's a little miffed about that. <laughs> it's hard to compete with uh, ghost-written celebrity books, you know? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> ghost-written celebrity books. You know, um, Jonathan, I had planned to start our conversation with some insight actually regarding what took place last night here in Georgia, which was our primary elections. Um, and we'll get to that a little bit later, but you know, we have to acknowledge the, the horrific mass murders down in Uvalde, Texas, uh, 21 people killed, uh, 19 kids. And, and as you know, gun ownership rights and sensible gun legislation, when they intersect, there's always this clash. But I just wanted to get your thoughts, uh, as this nation yet again, deals with another mass shooting, and here we are having politics get into it again. That's all I've been hearing all day. Um, just your thoughts, man. Sure. Um, uh, first of all, thanks for having me to the Atlanta History Center. It's great to be here, and it's fun to be back in Atlanta, uh, even as we uh, uh, once again mourn this senseless uh, killing. Um, look, I think it gets to the heart of this sort of tribal moment that we're in, how polarized our politics are. And this is one of the sort of overriding themes of our book. I mean, there's a reason why it's called This Will Not Pass. We're, we're locked in this moment of profound uh, division, and um, there, there's just not much room for, for compromise. And, you know, the fact is that one of the country's two political parties um, is just not open with some exceptions, to mm -hmm. uh, gun control measures. And 
that's actually kind of a new development. I think people have this perception that, oh, Republicans aren't going to do anything on guns. I mean, that's only like the last 15, 20 years. There was a time in American politics when you had much more liberal Republicans, you had conservative Democrats. I mean, Lord knows this state can relate to that. And you had Republicans who would vote for, you know, the assault weapons ban, for example. Mm -hmm. and this is not ancient history, by the way. This is like the 1990s. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we're just now in this period of, um, of, of polarization where we're sort of living in these sort of red and blue silos. And the idea of any gun control is just seen as a sort of a non-starter. And so, to be candid, I'm, I'm not sure that this will, will appreciably change that. Now, that said, I think there are some things that, they could do on the margins mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to, to uh, gun violence, but it's really hard to see um, with a, a sort of evenly divided Congress uh, anything remotely significant uh, on guns given, given the sort of view of the GOP. Well, and I also think to cite that you, you have to, you can't ignore the rise of the NRA and all of this, particularly after the Reagan administration, and you mentioned moving into the 90s, yeah. they have been a huge huge factor in all of this. Yeah, and had a, a remarkable run and immense grassroots support. I think their power was less their money and was more their rank and file support in the, the sort of political um, muscle that they had. Less in D.C., frankly, and more in the states where they had memberships that could deliver voters on primary day and election day that I think counted for, for quite a bit in American politics. What's so striking now is that the NRA is a shadow of what it was. Obviously, you've read these stories about their financial challenges and their leadership sort of turmoil, it, and it still sort of has a sort of um, a sort of you know ghost leg, if you will, right? It sort of still has that sort of yeah. power, even though their actual issues there have been besieging the, the organization itself. And I think that gets to the sort of larger issue was. You know, it, it's just now so in the groundwater of the, the right and of you know the Republicans that they're they're, they're not gonna not gonna act on this because they don't think that, that their voters want them to do anything about it. And interesting because and that, by the way, is a larger theme of the book. It is. is yeah. You got you know based one party that largely is acting based upon what it perceives its voters want, and when it comes to President Trump, that was precisely and is precisely uh, what the name of the game is. The voters don't want them to confront President Trump, therefore we're not going to. It should be interesting because uh, as we know, Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, was slated to speak at an NRA event this Friday. Don't know if that's still gonna happen, but it uh, should be interesting. Um, that being said, I, I do wanna go back to when you and, and, and Alexander couldn't be here. Uh, he's a little bit under the weather, so we wish him well, but I wanna go back to that bright light moment I don't know, maybe you're all getting coffee, you know, maybe you're having a burger, and you said, you know what? <laughs> let's look at these two administrations and let's let's see what we can compile. Yeah. So this started as a campaign book. And in 2020, we got a deal with Simon and Schuster, and the idea was this is gonna be a really fascinating campaign, uh, maybe like a once in a generation campaign. We should do a book on it. And as 2020 unfolded, as you guys will remember, there was a cascade of extraordinary events in this country. And by the end of the year, you know, former President Trump had not conceded the election. And it became pretty clear at that point, well, this is going to be a different kind of a campaign book. Mm -hmm. uh, because most campaign books end, yes, on election night in some way, shape, or form. And that wasn't an option. Yeah. And then on January 6th, I was in the Capitol uh, uh, that day and that night. And after that occurred, we went back to Simon & Schuster and we said, guys, we, we have to do something bigger and broader and more comprehensive and hopefully more lasting. We want to do a history of this period, of this extraordinary moment of, of tumult in American politics, of our system really facing a stress test of sorts that we haven't in modern times. And to their credit, they encouraged us to do that. And... Um, that's what we sort of came back with is, let's just do a sort of two-year account, 20 and 21. Yes, Trump, yes, the campaign, but also the aftermath of the campaign and all of 21 to capture both Biden's first year in office and the sort of larger aftermath of January 6th in both parties. We didn't want to sort of tack January 6th on as kind of a rushed epilogue of like, oh, well, you know, this too happened. We wanted to give it the treatment that we thought it required. And this would hopefully offer 
a history that, you know, in 30 years, 50 years, historians going back and trying to figure out what the heck happened in this moment, they can look at this book and sort of hopefully use it as kind of the building blocks for their research. But in between Trump and Biden yeah. and their administrations and the intersection there, you've got the pandemic. Right. You've got a, a racial, racial reckoning right. or awakening, whatever right. people want to call it. Y'all can email me later, you know, because folks argue about what it sure. was, uh, you know, and then you've got politics in, in all of this, uh, the murder of George Floyd uh, as well. So you and Alexander, what's the process then of laying out how do you tackle this? Because there's so many metrics, so many intervals sure. in between. So what we set out to do and I think did uh, in this book is capture uh, those moments, capture this period through the prism of the leadership of both political parties. So that meant President Trump and candidate Biden in 2020, and then obviously it means uh, President Biden in 2021. And it was sort of our view that this, this moment was going to be uh, revealing. Um, that I think the crises that you just outlined, I think we're, we're gonna sort of show what our politicians are made of. And I also think um, what we've done in this book is, I think exposed the, the sort of the chasm between what increasingly is the private conversation that takes place among politicians in <laughs> Washington when they don't think the cameras are on or they don't know that the audio tape is rolling, <laughs> if you will, uh, and the sort of the public portrayals uh, that they make. And I think um, we offer to readers a real look inside the room, on the conference call, on the Zoom. This is how your politicians in both parties are really thinking and what they're actually saying. I know, as your fellow journalist, it's easy to get folks off the record. Yeah. That's why we came right to many books about off the yes, record, because yes. we'll be sued or killed. Yes. Uh, but <laughs> it's just the truth. Let me tell you something. I covered the Atlanta cheating scandal. If I write my book, I have to change my name and move to Guadalupe or somewhere. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's always easy to get folks off the record. Yeah. You all, in taking the reader through all of these private conversations and recordings and, yeah. and documentation, but I'm curious because how did you have to convince them yeah. for this access and this insight? Yeah, it's a great question. So in my experience in daily journalism, which is all the journalism I've done, because this is my first book, has been you know, dealing with very reluctant sources, uh, no matter the party, um, who don't want to typically go on the record <laughs> talking about sensitive topics, like newsflash, they're politicians. That's not surprising. What we found in this book that was so rewarding, and um, I think both for the writer and hopefully for the reader too, is that when you told people during the interview, hey, this is not gonna be in the paper tomorrow, or next week, or even next month. This is not gonna be in print until next year. So you're speaking for history right now. Mm -hmm. And keep that in mind, it sort of offer the best insights you can knowing that this is not gonna be out for a while. This is for posterity. And that was the most remarkable thing because just saying that for a lot of people got them to a sort of more comfortable place and they were a lot more candid uh, whether these are Democrats or Republicans, both, especially talking about their own party. Right. You know? Well, I imagine, no, I don't have to imagine. I know yeah. you all were told some pretty inflammatory conversations, yeah. um, but I want to get to this. Sure. Can you tell us what didn't make it or you felt couldn't be used because you would uh, then have to move to Guadalupe and change your name? Yeah. No, it's a, it's a great question. And it'll just stay in this room. Yeah, don't tell anybody. Don't, don't tell, tell anybody. Tell don't put it on NPR or anything. <laughs> so we, um, we really tried, and there's an author's note at the front of the book that sort of gets to this. We really tried to be true to uh, verbatim conversations. When you see quotes in this book from participants, it's either because we were there for the, for the conversations or because we, we have contemporaneous accounts of some, some shape or form of that moment. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I, 
I can't remember what I said a half an hour ago, let alone six months ago. And I don't, I don't want to do one of these books where you have like pages of verbatim dialogue passed off as kind of like the gospel truth. So we really were, were sort of careful about, you know, if we're going to quote people in there and sort of quote dialogue, to know, you know, we actually know for a fact it's on tape or it's via notes that this was, was actually said. So there were things, yeah, where we, we had heard secondhand. This is the nature of reporting. You hear things secondhand and gossip, whatever, that we couldn't quite nail down. Like what? Um, I want some. Come uh, on, Jonathan. Quit. Come on. Phrases and lines that had been used in private by prominent political actors that were fairly provocative, but we just didn't have 100% bulletproof uh, uh, evidence that, w that was actually said. And like at some point, the clock expires, right? Like we had to eventually turn the book in in February of this year. Now it's one of the hardest parts. We kind of knew where to start the book. It begins in March of 20, because in March of 20, Biden effectively wraps up the nomination and COVID lands in America. It's a pretty consequential moment. So that was a sort of obvious start point for us because the Democratic primary felt like a little too distant to go back to. And we were trying to keep the book under 1,000 pages, uh, which we did. Um, but we didn't know where to totally end it, right? Because you're covering Biden's first year, so I guess you can go through like December 31st, or do you go through January 20th, or where do you stop? And it was tough for us to stop. But was there a point where you felt like somebody either was trying to sensationalize something or just flat out lying? Yeah. And can you? Oh, no. I mean, it's not like there was stuff that was contested. Like one person said, this fellow said X, and somebody else said, no, he didn't. It wasn't like that. It was more just stuff that we heard that was probably right that we just couldn't nail down definitively. And we didn't want to get stuff wrong in the book or have people after the fact say that's not true. And if some of you have hopefully noticed this, this book has been out since May 3rd. Mm -hmm. um, stories about it uh, emerged well before May 3rd. Um, the only person who's contested anything in the book was named Kevin McCarthy. Of course. And we know what the truth is there, yeah. so. Um, I don't know if you know, but you're a, black, you're a white guy and I'm a black woman. I noticed that. Yeah. There are some conversations I will never get into because folks won't let me into that. Yeah, sure. You think that was an advantage for you all? I think it helps in some ways and it hurts in some ways. Uh, Absolutely. You know, um, there's definitely sort of a comfort level with some people that I could probably get. Um, and then there's also a comfort level that I couldn't get with some people, too. Um, and I think that that, yeah, I, mean, I think it offers opportunity, certainly. And there, there's times where you can't quite get totally there because it's, eh. Why? Well, um, just the flip side of the coin, you know. What um, do you mean? You know, like, uh, I think it's hard to get a comfort level with some folks, uh, because of issues of, you know, gender, race. I don't think it's like a malevolent thing, but I just think it's more of a comfort level thing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it definitely benefits me in some ways, and mm -hmm. I think there's other, other sort of places where it doesn't help as much. How many interviews did you all conduct? Hundreds. Um, and we prided ourselves on doing a lot of work in Washington, and we really wanted to sort of get beyond this model of, you know, talk to 12 people who worked for President Trump or President Biden, who were all sort of senior staff. And look, we, talk, we talked to very senior people, but we wanted to do more than that. We wanted to talk to sort of younger people, a more diverse array of folks, um, members of Congress who had come in 2018 and 2020, who were fairly junior, who don't have a lot of power, to get their experience and their stories. And there's a lot of that uh, in there. And we also wanted to get beyond Washington, too. And so it's like not just one more Trump book, there's a lot on Congress, mm -hmm. but also not just one more Washington book. Because this story, th this moment politically, you know, was felt in cities like Atlanta and states like Georgia as well. So there's an entire chapter in this book on Georgia. Yeah, we're going to get to that yeah. in a moment. Um. Um, <laughs> and I think one of the things that makes this book different, and I think better, is that it is a more comprehensive account of this period. Look, there's been some fantastic journalism on former President Trump. But everybody in this room has read a lot of stories about President Trump like yelling at his staff and, um, you know, like saying wild stuff in the Oval Office. And like, I've written some of those stories, too, and that's valuable. But this period was more than just that. It was a much more consequential moment beyond just like 
that you know, like Trump fumes uh, type type vibes. And I think we we really tried to sort of get at that, especially around the former president and COVID and how he treated the nation's governors, who don't get a lot of attention in Washington, but obviously are crucial political players. And we go into great detail during COVID about how all these governors in both parties were coming to the former president looking for aid for their states at really sort of moments of crisis uh, in the first months after COVID. And Trump was effectively operating a protection racket um, and basically telling folks they had to be, be nice to him actual quote yeah. to, to get help. Anyway, sorry. No, no, it's okay. Let's back up a little bit because you take the reader through, as you all cite, three phases. You got the pre-election, you got election day to the inauguration of President Biden and the right. second impeachment, I think, of Trump. And then from February uh, last year to, to here. So let's start with pre-election. Sure. And we were kind of joking uh, back to back. I remember, and I think Al your, Alex may have written about this June 15th, 2015, uh, Trump Tower. <laughs> yeah, um, my co-author Alex, great guy. I'm sorry he's not here, and uh, he wrote for the Times the June 2015 story on Trump declaring his bid for the presidency, and uh, it wasn't a story that I think a lot of editors, if we're being honest, a lot of reporters took all that seriously at the time. But that's coming up on seven years now. I mean, it, Donald Trump has been a political force in this country now for almost seven years. I have a quote from that press conference. Yeah. Do you want to hear it? Yeah. And I'm not going to imitate former President Donald Trump. I know y'all are waiting for that, but I'm not going to do Can it. if you want. No. Okay. Total killer. <laughs> Our country is in serious trouble. Right. He told them in a rambling address that ranged from the threat of, from ISIS to, to the value of fracking to the recent prison escape in New York. Now, this is actually from New York, from the USA Today. Yeah. We don't have victories anymore. When was the last time anybody saw us beating, let's say China, in a trade deal? China. They kill us. Yeah. I beat China all the time, right. all the time. Right. Close right. quote. See, yeah. our, our industry, and I've been on record and very honest about this, we are just as culpable in this as well. You said a lot of folks didn't take him seriously. But then as he's progressing and he's saying just the wildest and wackiest stuff, and then the, the cameras are there and, and everyone wanting a sound bite, I am curious, because I want to shift for a moment, what role did the press play in, in Donald Trump's rise yeah. and how he progressed from 2015 to that day in November of 2016? Sure. Look, I think his celebrity can never be underestimated. And I think we collectively in the media that did not fully appreciate what The Apprentice did for him. Because, you know, I think a lot of us, frankly, didn't watch The Apprentice. Uh, if you're here tonight at the, at the Atlanta History Center, I'm, uh, Maybe I'm wrong here, uh, but I, but it was actually a significant uh, deal for him. It transformed him from kind of like a '80s era, uh, like New York tabloid provocateur, to in the eyes of millions of Americans, a successful businessman. Now you and I know like that was Hollywood, but I think that portrayal of Trump as a businessman on that show was an enormous springboard to a level of celebrity that he entered the primary with. And precisely that message that you just repeated of, you know, a business guy, we don't win anymore, we, we don't lose to China, I beat China all the time. I mean, like, if you drill down on that for like five seconds, it's obviously, uh, well, a flawed assertion, shall we say. But, like, as a soundbite for a lot of Americans, like, that's a pretty compelling... Isn't it time for an outsider? Yes. Isn't it time for a business guy to shake off Washington? Yes. Oh, well, Donald Trump was on The Apprentice. Like, that's an enormous head start. And so once he gets into the race, he brings that to the table immediately. And then because he's willing to be a provocateur, he gets ratings and he gets the attention to the other traditional politicians mm -hmm. who are up there, you know, in their stuffed shirts and their sort of like traditional uh, politician sort of rhetoric is not going to get the same attention. So, yes, I think TV especially. Mm -hmm. gave him an enormous leg up in the Republican primary, and his celebrity was a key ingredient to that. I do, though, think that in 2016, because I get this question all the time about the, the President Trump, by November of 2016, if you did not know who Donald Trump was and what he was all about, that is on you. Mm -hmm. There has not been a candidate for president who I think was examined that deeply. I mean, pe people's eyes were wide open about who he was 
in every conceivable respect, and how he treated people, his business dealings, his personal conduct, and that was well known, and people still voted for him. Mm -hmm. So I, I just don't believe that like one more story about Trump would have suddenly like opened people's eyes in 2016. What will the reader find out that you think folks didn't know in between that, the, that June, tw June 2015 announcement and November in terms of his meteoric rise in not just popularity, but hey, Donald Trump is going to be the Republican nominee here for President of the United States. What will they learn? Well, um, that uh, he was governing in a way that was dramatically different from uh, past American presidents. Look, look, look I mean, every American president, at least rhetorically, has tried to be the president for all Americans. They, even if you didn't vote for me, I want to be your president too. Every now, president? In modern times. Okay. Has tried rhetorically, at least, to present that way. And look, there's legions of examples, right? 9-11 uh, uh, and Lower Manhattan is devastated. George W. Bush, a uh, you know, conservative Republican uh, from a red state, rushes to the aid of a blue state. The bombing in Oklahoma City, Bill Clinton is never going to win Oklahoma in a million years. Democrat rushes to the aid of a red state. I, this is what presidents did. And I think with Trump, there was never even the hint that he was trying to govern for all people, that he was a president entirely for his coalition, mm -hmm. and he was looking out for the interest of his coalition. And, like, he was never shy, by the way, about that. Like, it's not like he tried to sort of suppress that. That's always kind of who he was. So I don't think it's necessarily a shock as to who he was. Um, it's just he didn't really change as president. He was the same person that we've always known, uh, that he was always he's always been. He just now had these powers of the presidency. What's so striking, if I could, though, is we went to see President Trump at Mar-a-Lago after he left the White House in April of 21, and we spent time with him. And he, he was, three months earlier, he had nuclear codes, and now he's at Mar-a-Lago, mm -hmm. and he's like pushing prime rib night on the members of his club. It was the damnedest thing. Well, it's in the better world. than pushing the other buttons with the coats. Uh, <laughs> it was it was the most wild thing to see him like back to being the hotelier sort of like uh, maitre d of sorts. You know, like uh, make sure you try the, the, the shrimp cocktail tonight. It's fantastic. How's your drink? And you know, we're interviewing him there as all of the sort of early bird special folks are coming in at like 5:15 p.m. Uh, in South Florida. It's a pretty hot hour, and like they're all walking into. Um, like have dinner, and we realized why afterward. Mm -hmm. said, now we know why he scheduled the interview for 4 p.m. Because if you're wrapping up at 5.15, and that's the early bird hour in Florida. So we as the reporters interviewing him for the book would see all these people coming into his club and kissing his ring mm -hmm. and telling him how much they missed him as president. And Trump would think, well, that will impress the, us, the reporters. At the same time, he wanted his members of the club to see him being interviewed by us mm -hmm. because that would impress the members of the club because it would say to them, see, I'm still relevant. I may have lost the election, but I'm still here, you know, being seen by these two guys from the New York Times. Isn't that impressive? And it, I think both of those things were to speak to the psyche of former President Trump. Does he say he lost the election in the book? Because that's better be news if the yeah, it's on page. No, <laughs> um, no. I look. He, he. Well, what's striking about the interview with with President Trump is, no matter what you asked him, within like eight to nine seconds, he would steer the answer back to, it was totally rigged. He was totally stolen. Uh, you're totally denying. <laughs> pretty good, Jonathan. It, it, not bad. Yeah, <laughs> total killer. Uh, that it was. Um, that it was all about 2020, relitigating that, and like we weren't there for that, and we're on the clock and. We would interrupt him and like steer him back to, yeah, but tell us about Kevin McCarthy. Um, and he, to his credit, like <laughs> would be happily interrupted and would engage for a few seconds and then he'd go back to his rant. When we were pushing him on Kevin McCarthy, mm -hmm. um, and obviously this is well before uh, the audio came out, we said, you know, Mr. President, like Kevin McCarthy's going around Washington saying in the days after January 6th, you know, he called you and he confronted you and said, you should take responsibility for this and own up to this. And Trump's waving his head at us and saying, no, no, it never happened, never happened. Kevin never called me and said that. And so he said, well, like, why is Kevin claiming that? And Trump said two words, inferiority complex. Mm -hmm. About Kevin McCarthy, his purported ally, who is now you know, uh, racing to repair their relationship 
Uh, it just tells you what Trump thinks of even his purported allies and what he's willing to say. And one last thing on the Mar-a-Lago trip, because this is also revealing, while we're there interviewing Trump, and this is all in the book, Lindsey Graham calls Trump on his cell phone. Of all course right. he does. Most politicians, or most people, frankly, if they have a call on their cell phone when they're talking to somebody else, will do one of two things. Send them a call to voicemail or take the call, stand up and walk away. Not Donald Trump. He answered the call from Lindsey Graham, put it on speakerphone, <laughs> and held the phone up for us to hear his conversation with Lindsey Graham. Yeah. And actually, the topic was about Georgia. This is April 21, and Graham was calling to report in that, hey, we got good news. Herschel Walker is going to run. He, he, he's, he's, he's open to doing this. We, we think we got him. And so it was like totally talking shop. And we're just listening. They're like, all ears. You know, like, what, what's happening? <laughs> Eventually, Trump has the grace to tell Lindsey Graham, hey, by the way, Lindsey, I'm here with two reporters from the New York Times. <laughs> you can hear the sort of gasp uh, over the phone. And, uh, but that's not enough. And Trump says, Lindsey, tell them about my endorsements and just how important they are. And so like Graham hears his music and happily takes the microphone and says, guys, let me tell you this. I have never seen somebody in the history of my party since Ronald Reagan have the impact on his party. He can pick these candidates in all those races. And Trump's like smiling, holding the phone up like this, you know. And, and then Trump's not done with them yet. Trump then says, Lindsey, tell them about my golf game. Uh, <laughs> Because he then wants Lindsey, this is what, what Trump really cares about, he wants Lindsey Graham to testify what a great golfer he is. And it was like one of those late night infomercials where it's like, look, I didn't believe the vitamins could work either. But, <laughs> but I've been trying these things for a week. I feel like a new man. I got more energy, more stamina. It was like one of those deals. So great, uh, Graham said, look, guys, I didn't believe it either, okay? I thought he was totally full of shit. Then I played with him for a round. This guy can really play some golf. It's amazing. And Trump was beaming with pride. God. Beaming with pride. Those two. Uh, let's talk about Georgia. Yes. Because it's well documented in the book. Yes. I could pretty much almost tell you the, the, the page numbers. Yeah. Um, what stood out to me, because it was on a date, which happens to be my birthday. Yeah. Um, the president's coming to Valdosta, December 5th. He calls the governor before even touching down. Um, now, He's, we think, as you write, that the governor's, that Kemp is going to give condolences because uh, right. Governor Kemp has had a death of someone close to the family. But I'll quote you here. But Trump spent much of the call bullying Kemp to call a special session of the legislature and pursue Trump's late cure-all. Trump was convinced that if Kemp demanded a rigorous standard of signature verification and reviewed all of the absentee ballots cast in the state, it would result in the overturning of the election, close quote. Yeah, so this was a really memorable day for those of you who followed um, Georgia politics closely. I, um, Brian Kemp had a friend of the family, very young kid who was killed in a car accident, tragic. And um, so Kemp was on this day, I think it was Saturday actually in early December, Trump was just, cons I mean, Kemp was consumed by this. And so he gets a call from Trump and I think expects it to be a condolence call I think Trump may have, at the start of the call, offered sort of cursory condolences. But then Trump goes back to what he's been talking about for the last month, which is the election was stolen. You have to call a special session to overturn the election. And Kemp just does not want to hear it. And I think this is a recurring theme in the months after the election is Trump calling, cajoling, bullying, pushing these Republican lawmakers to help him overturn the election. And Kemp, by this point, had already certified the results. He wasn't going to do anything else. But Trump thinks he's got some credibility or some 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 leverage because there's still the two Senate runoffs on mm -hmm. January 5th here. And so Trump is using Purdue and Leffler's races to sort of leverage Kemp. Um, and again, it's like a protection racket. It's like, well, you got those two Senate runoffs down there in January. It'd be a shame if something happened to them, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not perhaps that that unsubtle, but it's not far from it. Mm -hmm. And that's what was sort of looming over this entire period in this Georgia chapter is the Republican Party is basically paralyzed at this point, right? Because Mitch McConnell is desperate to retain his majority and to keep one foothold of power in Washington. Democrats have won the presidency. They've retained the House. The only thing up for grabs is the Senate. And it just so happens that the Senate's being decided in the same state where Trump's trying to overturn the election. So that's sort of the mood music for all of this. And um, 
McConnell is desperate and every Republican is desperate to keep Trump engaged and somewhat happy because they need Trump to come down to Georgia and rally the Republican voters mm -hmm. to show up again in January for Purdue and Leffler. It's a fascinating point in the book where Kelly Leffler and it appears Leffler and, and, and look, is sort of like, I don't know what to do. I have to go along with Trump because he's this huge influence. But as I was reading that part, I felt like, you tell me if I'm wrong, that at some point she might have realized, you know what, I need to just be myself and be more authentic yeah. and truthful and, and then you'll see what happened. She never, quite, she never quite got there. And I think, look, the Republicans tested this message. The most effective message that Leffler and Purdue had in their arsenal in that runoff was, uh, we will keep the Republican Senate and therefore be a check on the Democrats in Washington. If you like divided government, you know, we're going to sort of curb whatever liberal excess uh, of, of President Biden. And that tested really well in the polls. But they couldn't drive that message because yeah. that message would presuppose that Trump had lost the election and that there was now going to be a Democratic president in Washington. And we got audio of a conference call uh, with big GOP donors and David Perdue and Kelly Leffler, in which Perdue is saying out loud, like this is in November, what, like tr Trump's probably like not going to be able to hold on, and like you know we're going to be able to get some voters who didn't like Donald Trump in the suburbs because they're also like not going to want Democrats running everything in Washington. So like you know they're articulating this message behind closed doors, but but you know here you know once again they can't say it in public. I want to get to. President Biden, who was yep. then just a nominee. Um, and I want to talk about this part of the book, which is the process of picking a vice yes. presidential running mate. And now Al Sharpton, you all know Al Sharpton, who was really advocating for, for Stacey Abrams. Uh, Biden wanted someone, or his people, as they were saying, we need someone with more governing experience. Yes. Yes. But just that little section of, of, of talking about Biden's dilemma in picking yeah. a woman of color, a black woman. Yeah. And you, you mentioned, uh, I think, Val Demings and then... Jamie Duckworth yeah. in Illinois. And, yeah. Uh, and, and how each one came with something or didn't have this. One had this or didn't have that. So it was just kind of... And Stacey Abrams, who, you know, obviously was a very a, a star in the Democratic Party, but Biden just wasn't sold or, or they said didn't pass the test. Yeah, because the, I think they wanted somebody with more experience. I think the Biden people were very clear-eyed uh, about this process in terms of the American voter. And I, th I think the, uh, the concern was if, if we pick a woman of color, the American voter is going to be doubly tough on that candidate in terms of their qualifications, that fair or unfair, uh, that's the reality that we're gonna deal with. Therefore, we have to pick somebody who's got the obvious qualifications. And in Kamala Harris, you've got a former uh, city district attorney a former state attorney general and a current U.S. senator, someone who has the who has the sort of resume to do it, and I think that was a significant factor. I also just think this was entirely about one mission: beating Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And this VP process was not about, hey, you know, what's this person's policy portfolio going to be in the White House? Or, hey, you know, Joe Biden is going to be 80 years old here in a couple of years, and like maybe we should think about succession because. Perhaps he won't be running again in 2024 if he does win. That was not on the table. And it was entirely, how do we beat Trump? How do we get Trump out of the White House? They were not thinking beyond that at all. And I think that's at the root of some of the challenges today is they were making a sort of short-term pick. And you can't totally blame them. Like, that was, that was the entire mission at that moment, right? Well, he, well, it, beat Trump. Well, Biden had said, you know, I will pick a black woman or a woman of color for his running mate. Yeah, woman, yeah. So he, in a sense, had to pick someone. You mentioned the qualifications of Kamala Harris, obviously the Senate being very crucial now, we realize that. Uh, before we get to another part of the Biden administration, because I don't want to skip over this, and that is January 6th, mm -hmm. because this book does take the reader into, yep. into and you know, th that could be a movie, I, I don't know, you know, you could pick who you need to play to all different parts, but, <laughs> From your lips to God's ears. Oh my goodness, it is, it is wild. Yeah, I was in the Capitol on January 6th, and uh, it, it was obviously a uh, um, powerful, wrenching, uh, emotional day, but one I didn't fully appreciate at the time 
because it's like being in the submarine at the bottom of the ocean. You can't see the surface. Like you're inside the building. You can't appreciate what's happening outside the building. And so people in this room who watch this on TV or saw it on their phones, I think live this in real time in a way that I didn't. Also, like I'm a reporter, and so like immediately I, I'm like, you know, I'm covering an event, and that's my mission is to recover the event. But uh, I was evacuated with the entire U.S. Senate mm -hmm. um, out of the Senate chamber, and I just followed the senators. And as you know, um, if you've been to D.C. in the Capitol, beneath the Capitol there's a series of tunnels and, and little like um, mini trams that sort of take you to, to the office buildings. And I, the Capitol Police led the entire Senate into the tunnel, and I just followed them into the Hart Center the office building, and I was sequestered all day with the U.S. Senate. So the, the, the material in this book that, that you read about January 6th is entirely a first-person account from, mm -hmm. from um, my experience that day. And that night, um, I left the Capitol at about 1 in the morning. And Mitch McConnell had polio uh, as a child. In fact, he convalesced at Warm Springs a couple of hours south of here where FDR famously had his um, little White House. And so McConnell has a hard time walking downstairs because of his childhood polio. So he always takes the elevator uh, downstairs when he leaves the Capitol. And I know an elevator that he comes out of in the Capitol. So at one in the morning, I just stood by that elevator on the off chance that if McConnell is still here, he'll be coming out of this elevator. And sure enough, the elevator door opens up, and it's Mitch McConnell. And before I could even ask him a question, he summoned me and sort of brought me over to a little uh, a doorway and he said to me, what do you hear about the 25th Amendment? Mm -hmm. So he was looking for intelligence from me about what I was hearing during the course of that day on the 25th Amendment, which of course is the constitutional provision to remove a president from office. Um, and I told him what I had heard, which is that um, there was some chatter about that. But I wanted to know what was on his mind. And I don't typically treat Mitch McConnell like a Barbara Walters subject. How are you feeling? How's that feel? Because it's Mitch McConnell, right? Like, he's not somebody you can put, put on the couch very easily. Um, but in that moment, he had just lost his Senate majority the previous day because Georgia. So he loses what he cherishes almost more than anything in life, which is his Senate majority. And then that day, the capital that he has uh, sort of um, worked in since he was a college intern in 1964, is ransacked mm -hmm. and by a bloodthirsty mob. And so McConnell had the two worst days of his career mm -hmm. professionally. How do you feel? And he says to me, you want to know how I feel? I feel exhilarated. I was shocked. I said, exhilarated? Like, how could you be exhilarated after the last two days? He said, Trump put a gun to his head and he pulled the trigger and he's totally discredited now. And it was an extraordinary moment. And in his mind, in McConnell's mind, thank God, it's over. I got three Supreme Court justices uh, out of Trump. And this is not what he said, but this is like his, his thinking, I assume. He got three Supreme Court uh, justices out of Trump. He got a big tax cut. But he never liked Trump. He was embarrassed by him. He thought he was sort of beneath contempt. But now he wringed every drop of what he could out of this guy. And now this fellow he never liked in the first place is not gonna be a headache for him anymore because of what happened this day. And so I can wash my hands of Donald Trump. And so Mitch McConnell felt liberated. He felt exhilarated, as he told me, by that day. And he walks out in the, you know, out into the late night, it's about one in the morning on January 6th, and he believes, he believes mm -hmm. the Trump era is over, that, that this moment has passed. But as we know, as we know. I want to stick with something, because I do want to be fair, and I want to go back to the Biden administration, yeah. but you know, the Trump administration is so fascinating. Um, something that you just said in terms of Mitch McConnell, eh, I don't really like the guy, you know, but you've been hearing this more. It's always interesting when people are no longer within an administration, and of course, everybody writes a book. I don't know if you read John Brennan's book. I, I read his book. It's very, very thick. It's like, dude, why don't you say some of this stuff when you, you know, when, sure, it, sure. when it, not that it, it mattered, it mattered a lot more. Yeah. What is the hold? Is it clearly that because Donald Trump could make or break someone's? Oh, no, this is easy. It's voters. I mean, it's. Yeah. Well, it's, that's where I was going, yeah. It's entirely the perception that our voters like him and aren't tired of him and aren't embarrassed by him like we, the Republican elites, are. And so, therefore, we have to keep pretending like we're with him. Now, I think. You have more nights like last night where Trump's hand-picked candidates 
aren't just defeated, they're routed like David Perdue was. And I think there's going to be questions about just how much capital Trump has in the Republican Party and whether or not it's necessary for people like Kevin McCarthy to genuflect before him if he's not that big uh, of a threat. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think that some candidates will still need the Trump endorsement yeah, or look, the I think election was stolen sure. narrative? I don't think that the election is stolen narrative is sort of a big compelling issue right now, uh, at least enough to get somebody a nomination. But look, if you're running a Republican primary, like it definitely helps to have a Trump endorsement. Um, you definitely would want it. I mean, it helped obviously in Ohio and Pennsylvania. So yeah, it, it's, it sort of helps more than it hurts. So. Uh, I, I'm thinking I'm on closer looks, but I'm asking anyway. Do you think that Purdue then should publicly endorse Brian Kemp? Should he? Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's that, that that's his call. Like, I mean, I'm a journalist. That's not my decision to make. Uh, so what do you think? Uh, I assume that Purdue eventually will get there. I don't know if Trump ever will. I'm not sure Trump will ever endorse yeah. Brian Kim. I mean, it's so personal for Trump, right? It's not about policy differences. It's about, you know, you wouldn't do my bidding for me. It's totally yeah. personal. Yeah. See, now you know why I asked that question. I want to go back to Joe Biden's yeah. administration for a moment because this withdrawal, the, the, the whole withdrawal from Afghanistan, yes. and it's early in his presidency. Right. Um, but you all cite, this is, and I'm paraphrasing in a sense, yeah. that this is such a crucial and damning metric early on in his presidency that he cannot recover from. And it, it you don't necessarily say it's a downfall, but yeah. it was bad. It's an inflection point for yeah. Biden's presidency, right? He, he uh, is sort of riding high in the first months of his presidency. He passes the American Rescue Plan, which is kind of forgotten in history now, was a massive uh, bill in March of 21. He's able to get 19 Senate Republicans in the summer of 21 to vote for infrastructure, making progress on COVID. And then I think you get back-to-back -back blows, right? The, the Delta resurgence of COVID mm -hmm. combined with the, the sort of devastating images from Afghanistan. I think both of those create real doubts about Biden's leadership. Uh, and he's never fully recovered, um, from, I think, from that moment. And then you tack on inflation, which obviously, you know, can be linked to the sort of COVID rescue efforts. And he obviously is now facing uh, tough times. We are so glad that we did not end this book, by the way, right after January 6th, and that we captured the entire first year of Biden's presidency. It would have been a very different book if we had turned this into Simon & Schuster, in the spring or even summer of 2021, mm -hmm. uh, where Biden's numbers were so different. I mean, we have a scene in the book where Biden has, has uh, hi historians, Walter Isaacson, Doris Kearns Goodwin, Michael Beschloss, in the West Wing, and they're telling Biden, you can be the next FDR, like, this could be your new deal. And it goes to Biden's head. He, you have to understand about Joe Biden. He, he's a very proud man. He, he's been in Washington for a long time, but he still feels he's never been fully respected by the elites, by the smart set, both in the press and also in his own party. And now he has these historians telling him, you can be a transformational president. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about Biden is that he's got a sibling rivalry with Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And he feels like he was never fully respected by the Obama crowd, that he was treated like sort of Uncle Joe, there he is again, making these gaffes. And so for, for Biden to now be told he could be the next FDR, mm -hmm. oh, that's pretty heady stuff. And we have a moment in the book when Biden's riding high in 2021, and he tells, in a very unguarded moment, tells an advisor, he says, you know, I don't think Barack would like one bit the coverage of me as more transformational <laughs> than him. So don't underestimate the sort of male ego here at work, too. Yeah. And Joe Biden wanted to be seen as a big figure. But, of course, uh, Delta, Afghanistan inflation uh, has created uh, a much different scenario today. Was there someone you all wanted to speak with but either couldn't get to or they just declined? Yeah. I mean, look, we, <laughs> we kind of ran out of time. In fact, they, they were like the jaws of life taking the, the manuscript from us in February. Like, Yo, come on, you got to turn it in. It was hard. We wanted to like, keep reporting. And we, we were, even at the buzzer, we were still turning stuff in. Um, and so it wasn't easy to sort of stop reporting. Yeah, I would have loved to have done like more interviews with more people. And, um, you know, uh, President Biden did not sit down for an interview. Uh, he hasn't done really any books. That, that would have been helpful. But I think overall we got a 
fantastic material. And you know, I'm a I'm a competitor. Would have liked to have gotten more, but you know, you can only get so much. Eventually, you have to turn it in. You know. Well, let's talk about then that eventually turning it in because I love to ask authors this: when you turn it in, do you have a moment afterwards? And maybe you went to Alexander. He came to you and said, "Oh, you know what? We should have did this." Or, "Oh, God, I can't believe we." Forgot to mention this. Did yeah, no. I mean, what was great about this is <laughs> we were so worried, okay, because we made a bet that we're not going to rush this book out in 21, and we're not going to compete with the, the half dozen other Trump books in 2021. We're going to do a different kind of book, and we're going to take longer. But that was a gamble, right? Because it was totally possible that we'd lose some really good material either to other authors or it would just be in the paper. It would sort of be in uh, daily journalism. And so every day we're holding our breath. And we lucked out. I mean, every single major scoop in that book uh, held. And so we're, we're, we're feeling uh, happy about that. Um, the only thing that we were a little bit nervous about in terms of turning the book in in February and publication in May was the Build Back Better. Mm -hmm. and would Manchin cut a deal with Biden? Would there be some you know, significant bill passed after we turned the book in? Um, and obviously that hasn't happened yet. The scoops, is there a, I'm trying to figure out how to put this, is there a ultimate scoop in the book that is the, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think we generally thought that Kevin McCarthy being on audio tape saying he was going to call for Trump to resign was probably like one of the biggest things in the book. Um, and I think that's how it sort of turned out. Um, I think we kind of knew, knew that that would be significant that that was in there. Um, and it was. I'm curious, because, and I've had this happen to me where I've been excited about an interview, I get, get to the interview, I do the interview, totally. and I'm like, eh, was <laughs> did you no, have one of those absolutely. moments? This is always how it is, is in journalism or, or in, or in uh, any kind of reporting. Like, you have these interviews that you have such high expectations for, and the person is just giving you talking points the whole time, and you just, like, you can't wait till it ends because you're, you're just, you're, like, not drilling for any oil. It's like, my God, this is... What's going on here? Yeah. And there's other interviews that you have no expectations for. And like all of a sudden, there's like gold falling from the skies into your lap. And it's like, yeah. you're checking your phone. It's like, is this thing on? Good. <laughs> oh, God, this is amazing. Um, that, that's always how it works, right? Yeah, yeah and absolutely. It, it, it's just, you can never really tell how it's going to go. Um, it was funny that with a bunch of people, we could kind of figure it out in the first few seconds. They either get in the joke or they're not, you know? <laughs> so, all right. Like, you're talking for history here. You know what that means? Like, so, January 17th, tell us about that meeting. Yeah. And if they, you know, were engaging, then they'd engage. If not, then they're not, they're not. Did anyone come back and say, I know that was on the record, but could you keep it off the record, or could you scratch that? No one did that? Yeah, we, I, mean, I think we were very explicit, and purposefully so, with sources about this is for the book, period. And we're not going to do one of these tricks where it's like, yeah, well, it'll be for the book, but we'll, you know, maybe put it in the paper tomorrow. No, like, I think we, we were good to our word that we're, we're not going to use material for the book before the book. And I think that was a huge, huge uh, factor in getting folks to open up. Is there a different process for you? Alexander is not here, so I'll ask yeah, you sure. f in terms of when you're just the journalist writing the story, covering something, and then you're an author of a book. Because we have our, our, our journalist speak, our journalist yeah. lingo, and sometimes it comes out when you're trying yes. to write. I've sure. been writing a book for the last 10 years, and uh, I'm still on yeah. the yeah. beginning. Um, I felt like I could have more of a voice in this book than I would in my sort of daily journalism for the Times. Because you're writing for the New York Times. That's like an institution that's been around since the 1850s. And obviously it's changed uh, since the, the, those days, but it's still, there's still an institutional voice mm -hmm. at the Times that you have to conform to. You can sort of push the envelope, and I try to, uh, uh, to have some fun, but it's still the Times. I think with a book, uh, there's still standards and quality, and it's obviously proofed, but you can have more of a voice because it's not the New York Times. It's Jonathan Martin, mm -hmm. you know. I asked you when we started this conversation, yeah. you know, why you and Alexander decide to write the book, but yeah. do you worry about what the reader takes away or the perception yeah. that it's maybe not what you intend it to be, and then someone writes this, yeah. and, and the reviews, let's be really clear, the reviews have been very good. No, they've been, yeah. they've, they've been favorable, and we were you know, really thrilled with um, particularly what George Packer wrote in The Atlantic, if, if some of you saw that, it was a great a great piece, if you haven't seen it, check it out, um, George Packer in The Atlantic. Um, 
Uh, good plug. Um, and by the way, the book is available still out front here. Um, <laughs> operators are standing by. Uh, yeah, like I think that we, um, uh, we, we've been heartened by, by the response. And basically it was what we thought it would be in terms of how people are receiving the book. A lot of times we get these questions, we're doing podcasts or we're doing interviews, and they say, do, do you have any good news for people? Because like people want to hear that like, this will pass, you know, because Americans want to get, to get some good news. They, they want to hear there's progress, that it's not all doom and gloom. And like, like what we say to be candid, like we're not going to sugarcoat this. If you get to the end of the book, like we're 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 pretty um, we're pretty uh, I think sober in our assessment about the challenges that the, the country faces in the short term. This has not passed, and we're right. still facing this sort of profound political division. You mentioned the Atlantic, and I just think it's an earmark that we're great journalists because I picked a reference from the Atlantic. God love you, as Joe Biden would say. <laughs> Quote, as a document of decline and fall, a chronicle that should cause future readers to ponder how American leaders in the early 21st century lost the ability and will to govern. Close quote. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty pretty withering uh, and not far from the truth. Uh, look, the fact is that uh, politicians uh, are only as good as um, the folks that you're sending to Washington or to your state capitol, and um, if, uh, if they're not up to the job, then that's going to show, and I think that they've left a lot to be desired in, in, in recent years. Um, it's uh, it's you know discouraging, but you know here's the good news. I think like the history of the country, the long sweep of the country, at least for me, give me some comfort that we've stubbed our toe so many times and so many steps backward. But the long sweep, we eventually step forward and get it closer to a perfect union. We're not obviously there, but I think that's the trajectory of the country. That, 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 that long arc does tend to eventually get better. Um, but I think in the next few years, I mean, it's, I think we're, we're in for it. Before we get to q and I'm gonna borrow an exercise that it was with a, a national show I did. I don't know if it was a takeaway or on point. And the host had, the producer asked the, the panelists, the journalists, to write a letter to future generations about January 6th what would be your opening line and or your opening message and, and I remember I, I wrote you know we're sorry <laughs> we should have done better yeah. in terms of being a journalist I'm going to ask give that exercise to you if you're writing this letter to future future generation about January 6th or even just the period between Donald Trump and, and President Biden, but especially focusing on January 6th. What do you say, Jonathan? It can happen here. Mm -hmm. All right. That's why you got a bestseller, and I'm still on chapter one. <laughs> uh, Jonathan, it's a great book. I really appreciate Thank you taking you. the time. This was so fun. Yeah. A pleasure. One of the best. Is, is this one of the best? Is it, yes, no. This is really good. <laughs> She's good. <laughs> I felt like I was on NPR the whole time. It was, it was, <laughs> yeah. it was fantastic. I'm going to email Terry Gross when I get home. <laughs> Guess what Jonathan said. It was really good. <laughs> yeah. Let's take some questions in the, from the audience. And we want to remind you, I know some of you all have your own dissertations. This is not the space for that. Uh, so keep your question brief. Put a question brief. mark at the end. Yes. <laughs> Hi. How do you... Two questions related. How, how do you rep do daily reporting and write a book at the same time? I mean, that just seems absolutely extraordinary oh. to me. But then, how do you, I mean, you're getting paid by the New York Times. You're getting great information. How do you say, well, I'm not going to put this in the no. paper. I'm going to yeah. hold this for the book, yeah. even though my, I'm getting paid to write right. for the paper. Sure. How do, you, how do you square uh, that? No, uh, uh, very easily. Um, and I talked about, about this earlier. Look, we had explicit uh, conversations with sources about material being used for the book. And I think people are more candid about uh, uh, politics, about anything in life, when they know that it's not going to be in the paper immediately, if it's going to be for history. Um, but uh, 
I did spend a lot of time working on this book, also working on the paper. And material that I got that was not for the book, but that was for you know immediate usage, uh, absolutely put in the paper. And um, I, I think there's a bit of a misconception about journalism too, and it's sort of more more broadly. And I I get the question. I I really do. Um, that you know these things tend to be sort of like the, the news stork flaps his wings and like comes and drops this uh, incredible story outside your door one day and like the rest is is history. It, it takes a lot of work and like scraping and clawing and like confirming stuff and begging people to use stuff uh, at some level of attribution. That is like a nitty gritty of work. And it's not just a Hollywood type deal where like you're handing something on a silver platter. It, it, it's, it's a more complicated deal than that. Yes, ma'am. I was kind of interested in how do you like set up interviews in the first place? How do you get people to talk to you? Sure. What is the process of, of aligning all that? Cash. Uh, <laughs> Don't give our secret away, man. Come on. <laughs> no. So Alex and I have covered politics um, uh, between us for over 30 years. And like we were at Politico for years and then at the Times now, we have relationships with people in elected office, with, uh, with staffers, with uh, lobbyists, and all kinds of folks who are in and around politics in both parties. And people who are like really young and really junior and people who are really senior. And... Um, it's a relationship. It's just like knowing that people can trust you, that you have a professional reputation, that you're going to be thorough and you're going to be, uh, you know, tough but also fair. Um, I think helps a lot. And uh, also, I think people want to tell their story. And when they know that they're living through historic times, they really want to tell their story. Yeah. Uh, thank you for tonight and also for the book. Thank you. Uh, I know that guy. <laughs> Hey, Would you Rose. introduce yourself, sir? No. <laughs> uh, I'm Hank Klibanoff. Yes. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, well, you're one of the greats. So yes. Thank you for all you did. Absolutely. That's, uh, that's, I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> my, my question is this. It, for the last 20 years, I've just had this feeling that the, the, feeling that the Republicans were outsmarting the Democrats, that they, with the way they took control of the various state legislatures, with the way they uh, blueprinted the same legislation uh, from state to state to state, and then the way they made control of the judiciary the yeah. single highest priority they had. And because it begins to look like they understood that if they did that, they would control two branches of oh. government. Uh, your thoughts on that? Well. I'm not usually one to plug somebody else's book at my own book event, but Mr. Klibanoff himself wrote a fantastic book about journalists and the civil rights movement. And so, the race uh, beat. If you have not, if you have not read that, you should uh, write the race beat. Um, yeah, look, I think the Democratic Party, especially the kind of donor slash strategist and leadership class of the party, have been much more fixated on forever finding the next presidential candidate and occasionally like the next big senator at the expense of like, governor's races, state legislative races, the importance of the judiciary. I think you're onto something. I hear this complaint from Democrats all the time, especially Democratic governors who say, like, it's hard to get people's attention because they're so fixated on the president or the next president. And, uh, you know, Kennedy or Obama, there's, there's something in the Democratic DNA of always looking for that next sort of big, big star. And I think that um, that has hurt them uh, because or, um, they have not put in the sort of similar work effort to sort of lower level offices. I do think that the Trump experience has changed that to a degree. I think that because of the state legislatures and the role in confirming elections and obviously the judiciary, I think has opened eyes of a lot of Democrats about the importance of those less glamorous jobs in American politics. Um, uh, but no, it, it, I think it's an important development that, that certainly has created a gap between the two parties. Yep. And before we get to our next question, yeah. and I just want to brag a little bit on, on Hank, and Please. this also includes you, because as a journalist, and, and I've done so many projects with Hank and conversations, I always tell folks it should never be about the storyteller should be about the story. Yeah. And when journalists like Jonathan and Alexander and 
and, and Hank and, and a lot of folks I know, they put in the work. We really do put in the work. I know you think it's easy just to come in and sit down and start writing or to come in and sit behind a mic and just start yapping, as I say. Um, but we, you, you would be surprised. You asked about, someone asked about you know, the interviews. I had to go to a hot yoga session <laughs> to get an interview with the city council person. There you go. And I hate hot yoga. The lengths we go. And it was hot. The lengths we go. And, and you know, I'm like, what? And they're like, you have to be, I'm going to yoga. You can come with me. That's the only way I'll do the interview. And I'm like, yoga? Hot? And uh, good. I almost fell out. It was, <laughs> but I got what I needed. That's the links we go to. Question. Looking forward, yeah. what will the impact of the January 6th committee have on the midterm elections? Yeah. No, it's a really good question. I think this is one of the things Democrats have a struggle with is, you know, on the minds of so many people at the top ranks of both parties is the health of our democracy. It's a lot of what we talk about in this book. You know, can our self-government uh, you know, still, still work here? And uh, can our institutions still function? And I think that, that that really alarms Democrats that, you know, 2022 and 2024 could be an even more acute stress test for a democracy than 2020 was. But, you know, you go to war with the army you have, as a, a fellow once said. <laughs> the electorate decides what the biggest issues are. And Democrats take surveys of voters and they campaign based upon what they believe via research data shows voters care about. And right now, it's not the health of our democracy. Voters are focused on the price at the pump, the grocery store, inflation generally, um, you know, schools, the after effects of COVID, uh, I think obviously guns now. I, think, I just think like the day-to-day -day issues that voters face are much more top of mind in this um, election cycle. And I just say all that because I think that the, the, the committee could come up with some really uh, penetrating material. Uh, I just am not sure it's going to change the mind of John Q. Voter out there who's going to, you know, the, the Shell station and paying five bucks a gallon. Um, and that's not just me popping off. That's like a lot of data shows that same, that same point. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Hi, Jonathan. Oh, wow. <laughs> This is a home game here for me. Hey, Debbie. Um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about J.D. Vance. Yes. Who was a never-Trumper yes. and, you know, did Some a, folks in this room maybe even bought his book, speaking of buying books. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, no, uh, I, yeah. look, I think J.D. Vance, uh, Debbie, I, is um, – a great illustration of the accommodations that a lot of Republicans are willing to make in the Trump era to run for and to be elected to office. Of, you know, <laughs> he said all the things he said about Trump, but look, the, the fact of the matter is, if you want to be uh, elected now, it's hard to run against Trump and still be elected in a Republican primary. Now, Brian Kemp showed that you don't necessarily have to be Trump's candidate to win. But it's hard to be affirmatively anti-Trump, if that makes sense, and still, and still survive in the Republican Party. Like, you know, it, the Republican Party is 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 sort of still Trump-ish, if not Trump himself dominated. Well, and I want to add this too because yeah. there was an article in Political this morning that I read that talked about how strategic. Yeah. You know, Brian Kemp was, and and he'd been building this. You know, he got out ahead of Purdue. Uh, but let's be really clear, Brian Kemp never said anything negative about Donald Trump. Correct, correct. Never. Right. He ignored him. Ignored yeah. him. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, so I've, I've read your book. I congratulate you on it. Thank you, sir. And a lot of people don't come off very well in the book, of course. Yeah. But there do seem to be nice things said about some of the Republicans who oppose Trump, like Liz Cheney, Anthony Gonzalez. So do you view those as some of the people who come through as sort of heroes in your book? Yeah, I, as a journalist, like, I'm really loath to um, portray people as like heroes or villains. I just like, I don't know, like, I just don't like doing that. I, I kind of view people uh, as more complex than that. Um, I think we're pretty unsparing about most politicians generally, but you can't ignore the fact that it took courage politically for 
uh, a handful of Republicans to speak out against uh, uh, Donald Trump. Um, and uh, that's not a partisan thing. It's not an ideological thing. I mean, I just, you know, on the merits. Um, yeah, look, I think Liz Cheney said this uh, in 2021, that if the, the impeachment vote against Donald Trump, the second impeachment vote, had been a secret ballot, there would have been a hell of a lot more than 10 Republicans in the House who would have voted to impeach him. Um, and there just weren't. And I think, again, they did not want to take a risk of alienating their voters. Uh, we have a scene in the book on one of these conference calls that the House GOP was having after the 6th. And there's this backbencher from Ohio. And he said, look, Trump deserves accountability. I'm not letting him off the, uh, off the hook here. But I hear from our voters back home, and they don't want to hear it. They're asking us about where's the accountability for Hillary Clinton and for Hunter Biden. Because their voters back home um, are focused on their information silo, which is like driving the information about, you know, sort of real and perceived democratic wrongdoing. And that, that comment was so revealing to us, and we put it in the book, because that's the motivation for a lot of these lawmakers. Our voters don't want to hear it. They're focused on the other side, period, the end. Yeah, in the back. Hi. I'm curious, two questions. Have you, what have you heard about the Supreme Court leak regarding Roe v. Wade? And then the second question is, do you anticipate what is going to possibly happen affecting the midterms? Yeah, um, I haven't heard any sort of inside uh, information about the genesis of the leak. I used to work at Politico. I know the reporter who got that scoop. He's a tenacious uh, legal reporter. He's one of these guys who like reads every opinion from every obscure appellate court and kind of knows the ins and outs of the system. So I'm not, I'm not surprised that he got it. Um, look, uh, if we do have a, an opinion next month from the court that you know, fully overturns Roe and outlaws legal abortion, um, you know, I, I think that that would be a significant uh, factor in the midterms. This sort of that could be a galvanizing factor. I'm just not sure that that ultimately is what the opinion is going to be. And also, I'm reluctant to like look into the future uh, and sort of like try to figure out events this fall when we're in May of the, the year. I mean, politics moves so quickly now. Yeah. Um, and I also wonder, um, Americans are in a pretty sour mood, and I'm not sure that that would totally change uh, the, the sour mood of Americans. And when people don't feel that well about the country, they, they tend to take it out on the party that has power. I think there was a poll last week that had the question about right track, wrong track. Mm -hmm. It's like 17% of the country said America's on the right track. That's really dismal. And when it's that low, the party in power tends to pay a price. Um, but I think, you know, this could be a factor and it could mitigate some of that potentially. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. All right. Is that it? We have one more. Is that it? Um, hey, can I just say? We yeah, have please. one more? Yeah, right there. I think your answer will be, I don't know, but I think I'm speaking for most progressives. Yeah. Do you think um, Donald Trump will ever pay the consequences for any of his actions? I mean, I'm exa personally exhausted by this. You look at the Mueller report, the Access Hollywood, two impeachments, um, and- Well, he was um, defeated. And we're looking now at um, Merrick Garland does not seem to be very aggressive. Yeah, so, I mean, he was defeated. I mean, you know, he, he lost the presidency, and his party lost both chambers of Congress. Uh, that was a pretty, I mean, he faced some accountability, right? I mean, they lost for the first time since Hoover, lost all, th all two chambers of Congress and the presidency. So he did face some accountability from the voters in 2020. Look, I, I can't look into a crystal ball and tell you that, you know, the, the DA in New York is going to indict him uh, or what's going to happen. Um, but obviously he's now a former president and he, he does not have the ability to, you know, sort of have that enjoy the power he had when he was president. Is he ultimately ever gonna face the kind of accountability that, that you want him to, to face? I'm not sure. But he has faced accountability from the electorate. Um, 
He was defeated in a year that was otherwise a pretty good year for the Republican Party. They gained House seats even though uh, he, was, he was rejected, uh, which tells you a lot about the judgment of the American voter, which was, I think, pretty sharply aimed at Donald Trump himself. Um, before we close, I want to say thank you for this fantastic uh, conversation. And yeah. just mention two things. One is I'm going to be out there signing copies of the book in the back, so please come say hello and get your book signed. And if you do like the book, um, this could really help a lot, if you don't mind. Just take a picture of the, the book cover here and put it on your Facebook oh, or look your, at you. look your Instagram <laughs> or your Twitter. It helps. Word of mouth really, really helps. And so uh, I thank you for, for being here tonight and for all your great questions. It thank does help. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank, thank you so you, much. Congratulations awesome. on everything, Appreciate man. It. Appreciate it. Yeah. Better late than never. And and my book will be out in 2026. I'll be back. <laughs> I'll, I'll put you on the hot seat. Hank Klibanoff will be doing the uh, interview. Thank you all so much. Please be thank safe you. going home. Get your book signed. <laughs>